Okay, so today we're looking at the brief for effects of control. So um, these are a series of briefs to prepare you for your recreational pilot license. Um, and uh, the plane we'll be doing this brief for is the Piper Cherokee PA28. <clears throat> and it's a nice introductory, introductory brief to introduce the aeroplane's controls. So in terms of housekeeping, um, so uh, I'd explain housekeeping at this point if we were in a physical environment. A, an introduction to the primary and ancillary controls of an aeroplane, their method of operation, and their effect on the aeroplane in flight. So the primary controls are important to control the aeroplane, and the ancillary controls are just important. Um, so the method of, of operation, we'll have a look at how to use them, and the effect on the aeroplane in flight. So when we go out in flight, what will it do to our aeroplane? Um, and also we'll have a look at their limitations as well. You as a student will form the foundation of your flight training. So controlling an aeroplane is an essential task all pilots must learn. Find most aeroplanes will have a similar set of controls. Um, you know, they'll have a rudder, wings, elevator, which helps to be able to control them uh, through the three axes, which we'll talk about as well. Allow you to understand the primary and ancillary controls and its effect on the aeroplane. Um, and also form the basis for moving on to more complex aeroplane types during later stages of training. So in order to ensure a safe and efficient operation, um, a good pilot must have a thorough understanding of um, its control of the aeroplane's controls. So an overview of what we'll have a look at today. So objectives, that's a take-home message. We'll have a look at definitions um, that will be relevant for today. We'll have a look at deflection of air, um, you know, how our aeroplane wings produce lift, one of the theories. Um, we'll have a look at axes of an aeroplane, the three axes, uh, the primary control surfaces, We'll have a look at ancillary controls, the effects, the limitations. We'll have a look at the, the airmanship and threat management considerations. Uh, so it's something new. We'll def I'll define um, airmanship and also threat and error management, what each of those terms are and how they are um, applicable to our flight. I'll summarise everything and then I'll ask you a few questions with the objectives. So following this brief, you'll be able to, from memory, name the four properties that can affect air deflection. So this is important. It tells us how lift is produced. Um, and what contributes to it. Name the three axes of an aeroplane. Um, so important, you know, these are the three axes that our aeroplane moves around. Identify the primary controls and state their primary and secondary effects. Um, so this is important, it allows our, to us to control our aeroplane in a three-dimensional environment and also, you know, the secondary effects um, you know, tells us what we'll actually see in flight. And finally, describe the function and purpose of the five ancillary controls. So uh, this is important. As you know, these ancillary controls are just as important as the primary controls. Um, we'll have a look at the method of operation as well. So in terms of the definitions, so cord line, the straight line joining the leading edge to the trailing edge of the aeroplane. So the um, leading edge, that's pretty much the front part over here of the wing. And then we've got the um, trailing edge, which is the back part. And that cord line is that straight line which joins the front to the back of the wing. Relative airflow describes the direction of airflow in terms of the position of the wing. It acts parallel and opposite to the direction of the flight path. So um, this is important, you know, it tells us where the airflow is coming from with respect to the aeroplane's um, flight path. So here the relative airflow is coming parallel and opposite. <coughs> So if we had the aeroplane travelling, sort of descending, um, that would be the flight path. The relative airflow would be coming like this. Um, and if the, the aeroplane, let's say, um, I'll describe it as a high nose attitude, but the flight path was sort of horizontally, then the relative airflow would be coming along opposite. So that's the important part, the direction of flight path. Uh, definitions, so um, further definitions, angle of attack, the angle between the cord line and the relative airflow. So, you know, we've looked at these two definitions, relative airflow and cord line, and now we get angle of attack. Axes, an imaginary line about which a body rotates. For example, um, the earth revolves around its axis. Attitude, position of the nose in relation to the horizon. So, you know, this is really important where visual flight rules for pilots, you know, we fly by looking outside. Um, and by judging the attitude of our aeroplane, um, by, you know, looking at that position of the nose, where it is with respect to the horizon. 
and then finally center of gravity the point at which the gravity can be considered to act with so weight acts through the center of gravity um, and no matter the air, well, attitude of the airplane it always acts towards um, the center of the earth and the reason why it's relevant today is we'll have a look at our three axes which all intersect through the center of gravity so deflection of air newton's third law so newton's third law is every action has an equal and opposite reaction um, and the way we can see this is, um, you know, a rocket um, uh, propels thrust towards the ground, which pushes it in the air. Um, a skateboarder pushes against the ground, which um, backwards against the ground, which allows them to go forward. And then also a swimmer as well, you know, they push, they um, propel all the water towards the back, which allows them to move forward. So what does this have to do with an aeroplane wing? As the airflow travels forward, the airflow hits the airflow and is deflected downwards, producing an upward force. So similar to you know what we've looked at the previous slide, so we've got the relative airflow here, um, that's deflected downwards, which produces an upward total reaction. So it's equal and opposite um, reaction. Another way you can look at this is kind of like a flat plate. So this generates a force known as a total reaction, which is combined result of the two aerodynamic forces of lift and drag. So I'd like to describe it like you're putting your hand outside the window. So you encounter, you know, you're driving along 30 kilometers, 40 kilometers per hour. You encounter the relative airflow, which deflects our air downwards. Um, since, you know, you operate in the atmosphere, you encounter some drag. But due to that equal and opposite reaction, you get that lift. And the combined forces of lift and drag produce the total reaction. So factors that affect total reaction, so just briefly go through each of these four factors which and we'll have a look at how it affects our airplane's um, wing or surface, so angle of attack, airspeed, surface area and air density. So if velocity is increased, the lift generated increases. So um, you know, your house, hand, hand outside the car, you know, if you're travelling at 40 km per hour, yeah you're encountering um, total reaction but it's not as much as you know, if you're traveling at 80 kilometers per hour, you're pretty much encountering twice as many air molecules, which gives you a greater total reaction. So it's all about the manipulation of air molecules. Angle. The angle of the wing in comparison to the relative airflow. Um, so if the angle is increased, the lift generator increases. So you know, if you're putting your hand outside the window, it's at a shallower angle. Um, yeah, you get a total reaction, not as great. But if you look steeper, you get a greater deflection, greater total reaction as well. Um, and you'll see this in flight also with in terms of airspeed. You know, you have a fast airspeed. You can move your controls a lot more. Uh, more lift is produced in terms of our wing. Same thing with angle as well. So surface area. So uh, if you're putting your hand outside the window. So, you know, if you've got a smaller hand, it produces less total reaction. Um, but let's say, you know, for lack of a better example, you're using... Um, a table tennis paddle, which has got a larger surface area, produces a greater total reaction. Air density. So, um, you know, in terms of air density, so when we look at density, it means um, mass divided by volume. So if you have a certain volume, um, how much air you have. You know, more dense means more um, mass of air. Um, less dense means less mass of air in the same volume. So less dense atmosphere. Um, you get less total reaction, but more dense, you know, you've got a higher pressure system, produces a greater total reaction. So this is the um, engineer's lift formula. So it's used by engineers when they design a wing. Um, and in terms of what it's comprised of is uh, lift, which equals the coefficient of lift. Uh, so angle of attack and wing shape, which is also called camber. We'll have a look at that in our straight level lesson. And that's pretty much camber and wing shape. Is the same thing it's the shape of uh, the wing how curved it is um, air density as well which, which is called half rho so rho is a Greek letter V squared speed and s so you know speed has a bigger um, sort of factor that's why it's squared into in terms of how lift is produced um, and this is all the four properties which we've just talked about as well um, angle attack density speed and um, surface area and wing shape sort of comes under coefficient of lift. So the axes of an aeroplane. So an aeroplane has three axes of movement because it operates within a three-dimensional environment. 
Um, so it makes it quite easy, you know, for the pilots to control. We only need to move our aeroplane about three um, axes. Deflection over the control surface creates an equal and opposite reaction, allowing the aeroplane to move around the three axes. Um, so pretty much, you know, you can roll around the longitudinal axis, you can pitch above the lateral axis, and you can yaw above the about the normal axis as well. Um, and all of these, as we mentioned for our definitions, intersects through the center of gravity. So the primary control surfaces, so the ailerons causes the aeroplane to roll around the longitudinal axis. So um, let's, for example, you know, rolling towards the left, um, your the right wing aileron deflects upwards. Um, and, um, sorry, when you're rolling towards the left, the um, downgoing wing, so the left wing, um, the aileron goes up, which produces a total reaction to move the wing down. And vice versa for the other wing, um, you know, the aileron moves down, which produces a dodo reaction up, which allows the aeroplane to roll towards the left. The stabilator causes the aeroplane to pitch around the lateral axis. So one quick note about the stabilator. So our aeroplanes, you know, we've got a stabilator, the whole um, control service moves. But on some aeroplanes, you know, such as the Cessna aeroplanes, um, there's a certain sort of fixed part. And then there's the elevator, which actually is hinged and moves around. Um, and that causes the aeroplane to pitch around the lateral axis. Um, so what this means is, you know, the, stable, you know, your, the pilot um, applies back pressure. The stabilizer moves sort of towards the uh, down and then up position. And that produces a tail direction going that way, which wants to move the tail plane down, which pitches the nose up. And then vice versa. Um, if you want to uh, pitch your nose down, uh, that would be sort of going upwards at an angle um, and it would cause that total reaction to pitch your nose down. And then rudder causes the aeroplane to yaw around the normal axis. Um, so if you yaw towards, you apply the rudder pedals, you yaw towards the left, the rudder, pedal, the rudder will move towards the left, which produces a total reaction which moves the tailplane towards the right, but moves our nose towards the left and vice versa towards the right. So this is something you'll see in flight. Um, I'll introduce the three control surfaces um, and how they move. Lateral axis, pilot applies forward or backwards pressure on the control column. The primary effect is a change in pitch and the secondary effect is airspeed. So here we've got that lateral axis causes our aeroplane to pitch nose up and down and it's controlled using the control column the, or the yoke um, as well. Um, you can apply forward pressure or backward pressure as well. Backward pressure pitches it up, forward pressure pitches it nose down. So why does the secondary effect happen? So it's kind of like you know a cyclist. Um, they're cycling, they're pedaling along. Um, when they encounter a hill, they start to slow down. Um, kind of like with our aeroplanes, you know, we pitch the nose up. What you'll see in the when we're going out flying, the airspeed will start to decrease. Um, the reason being, we've got a more a higher angle of attack which produces a lot more drag, which will decrease our airspeed. Same thing with that cyclist, they, um, they um, roll down a hill, um, that force of gravity allows them to accelerate, also with our aeroplanes. When we're descending, um, we've got less angle attack as well, which increases our airspeed. Um, and then when we operate in the training area, we've got a threat. So in terms of threat and error management, we've got the threat of stressing the airframe. Um, and if you apply abrupt control input, this could cause damage to the aeroplane. So make sure to have nice and smooth um, input as well. So uh, the longitudinal axis, so the pilot moves the control column left or right. Um, so that's a control column here. It works in a natural sense. Uh, primary effect is roll left or right. So you move the control column left, the aeroplane will roll towards the left um, and vice versa. And the secondary effect is a yaw in the direction of the roll. So you roll um, towards the left, you'll see that yaw in the direction of the turn. Um, so we'll see this in flight, but how, um, how and why does this happen? Well, the reason being is, um, so when you're sort of rolled, you don't have enough lift to maintain level flight, um, you know, in terms of that extra lift required, so you start to slip. Um, and then as you slip, you're, the relative airflow impacts the tail plane, which causes that yaw in the direction of the turn. And you'll see this in the flight as well. Um, in terms of normal axis, the pilot moves the, uh, it's also called the vertical axis. 
Um, the part moves the rudder pedals left or right, which is underneath the control column. Um, so we've got the left and right rudder pedals, so it's the bottom one, uh, the top ones are for brakes. The primary effect is a yaw left or right, uh, so you apply the left rudder, the aeroplane will yaw towards the left, and the secondary effect is a roll in the direction of the yaw. Um, so that's something we'll also see in flight. But why does it happen? Well, um, the reason why it happens is because um, you know, when you're yawed, when you're yawing, um, let's say towards the right, the outer wing travels a greater distance than the inner wing. But since they're stuck onto the fuselage, um, they have the outer wing has to travel faster um, to cover the say a greater distance than the inner wing, um, and that creates a lot more lift, which causes that roll in the direction of the turn. That's uh, that, and then that slip as well. So in terms of primary control so summary, so we've got the stabilizer. So the axis is the lateral axis, primary effect is pitch, and the secondary effect is airspeed. We've got aileron, um, the axis is the longitudinal axis, uh, the, primary axis the primary effect is roll, and the secondary effect is yaw. And then the control surface, um, we've got um, the rudder, axis is normal, primary effect is yaw, and secondary effect is roll. Balancing the airplane, <coughs> the turn and slip coordinator indicates the balance of the airplane. So here's the um, turn and slip coordinator, um, and you want it in the balance. So here, this right image, um, and it's part in terms of our so pilot six pack, our six main instruments. Um, this is one of them, it's on the bottom left as well. Um, and it is used to help coordinate turns to prevent the airplane from skidding or slipping. Um, so we'll have a look at what skidding and slipping means in our turning brief. And the balance ball will be in the center in a correctly coordinated turn. So make sure to step on the ball. Um, you know, if the ball's out towards the left or right, you're feeling sort of side loads away, um, and that's why you want to keep it balanced as well, primarily um, for turns, climbs, and descents. So ancillary controls. So ancillary, you know, definition means to provide necessary support to the primary activities and operation of the airplane, and it's as useful as a primary control. Um, as, and without them, you, know, you simply would not be able to fly. So that's why we need to you know how to use them. The five ancillary controls are carburetor, we'll shorten it to carby heat, mixture, throttle, flaps, and trim. So you sort of go from right to left. Um, carburetor, uh, sorry, the carburetor, mixture, throttle, the flaps, and then the trim as well. So carburetor heat, so it redirects hot, unfiltered air to the carburetor to melt slash prevent ice. The icing, you know, we don't want icing to occur. It can cause um, a drop in our revolutions per minute, our RPM in terms of the engine. Uh, it can cause rough running, um, and worst case scenario, it can cause engine stoppage due to the lack of fuel. And this isn't, uh, it doesn't even necessarily have to be um, icing from um, the atmosphere. It can simply be due to um, the throttle icing of fuel, um, freezing, as well. Uh, so yeah, use below 2000 RPM, so conditions where below of which icing can occur. So it's a small knob to the right of the engine control, so over here. Um, up is off slash which is cold, down is on slash hot, so it's a little bit of the opposite controls. Um, and the limitations must not be applied on the ground for longer than 10 seconds. Um, our carburetor, you know, sucks up air um, from below the sort of engine, so you know, it can suck up on the ground um, other debris, and since it's on um, some dirt, dust, um, some leaves, and since it's not filtered, it can get into the engine, so that's why we don't use it for longer than 10 seconds. So this is a, a bit of a complicated, uh, complex, sorry, diagram of a carburetor. So um, this is a carburetor on, so normally outside air is filtered and goes straight into the carburetor, um, but here we've got um, outside air, air. Um, it comes in through the um, carburetor air intake, um, gets warmed up using the exhaust gas muffler and then goes into the carburetor as well. It's not the exact actual exhaust gas, it's the air being warmed up due to the hot pipe um, from the exhaust gas as well. So the mixture, so it's controlled using the red octagonal knob, so that's this knob over here, um, and it controls how much fuel is going into the engine. So as you pull the lever back, less and less fuel is going into the engine, so forward is rich and aft is lean. So in this, um, in the image over here, um, the mixture is in the what we like to say in the, in the idle cutoff position. 
So no uh, fuel is going into the engine at all. So that's how you would shut down the engine. Um, and it's a ratio of 15 parts of air to one part of fuel. You know, if you think about a drinks mixer, um, or if you think about um, you know a sugary syrup or cordial, um, it is a ratio of say three parts of water, one part of uh, the sugary syrup, just like the, the um, this is the air to fuel ratio we like to describe it. Uh, limitations: so make sure to lean after startup and keep it lean during ground operations. Um, you know on the ground we um, um, you know we're um, we're running at low power settings. And so we don't have as much air coming into our aeroplane or um, that or so much as much power we need. And if we have too much fuel, that um, fuel can't mix in properly and it tends to pull at the bottom of our engine, which can cause you know, corrosion, um, so which we don't want. And we don't want that to occur. Throttle. The throttle is the black lever over here. So as you can see in this image, right next to the mixture, it controls the amount of air that is going into the engine. So we control with fuel with mixture and air with our throttle. So it controls this uh, the butterfly valve. Um, so forward increases power and aft is a decrease in power. So um, and yeah, um, it controls it is controlled using, it controls this tachometer. And on a fixed pitch propeller, an increase in throttle movement will um, increase RPM and vice versa. Um, and the limitations, you must not go past 2700 RPM as it can cause um, damage, you know, overstress uh, and overheating and um, we don't want that to occur. So in terms of the training area, we'll have a look at, oh, in terms of the flight, when we go out to the Bankstown training area where we'll practice these maneuvers, um, we'll, we'll look at the thro control surface effectiveness. Um, when you're going at fast speeds, the surface is quite effective versus at slow speeds. Um, the slipstream effect, so an increase in throttle causes the propeller to spin fast. So on a clockwise spinning propeller, on a prop, um, the clockwise movement of the propeller pushes a spiral of air back, so as you can see in the image. Uh, this impacts the left side of the tailplane, um, but there's nothing at the bottom to impact, so it's not even. This yours the airplane to the left, noticeable during takeoffs and climbs, and so in order to counteract this, the pilot will need to apply um, right rudder as well. So you'll see this in flight and during um, you know, those takeoffs and climbs when you use a high power setting, you'll need to apply right rudder, otherwise the nose will start to yaw towards the left. Effect of flaps. So flaps increase lift and drag. So as you can see here in this image, you know, it, um, it extends, uh, sort of comes out, in terms of it affects our coefficient of lift. Um, yeah, it increases our lift, allows a greater deflection of air, but it also increases our drag as well as it comes into the air um, airflow. Allows you allows for a steep approach, allowing you to send quicker, quicker and a better forward view. Remember that due to that drag, we have to um, have a lower sort of nose attitude, um, and then we get a better forward view. The flat ranges on the Cherokee are 10, 25, and 40 degrees, and is controlled using this flat lever over here. Um, so it's kind of like a car handbrake as well, and even in terms of its extension. Um, you know, you extend it, uh, sort of one, two, three stages, so 10, 25, and 40, um, and then to retract it, you have to press the button and then retract it in stages. <coughs> the limitations are, you must verbalize white arc, so verbally, you know, let your instructor know. Once the airspeed dial is in the white arc range, and do not extend the flaps until below it. Um, you know, in the wire airplane, it's 103 knots, because you know if you extend um, above that speed, it can cause um, air, uh, flap damage as well. Um, so you don't want that to occur, and that's one of the threats that exist: the threat of not verbalizing white arc. The error will be flap extension above VFE. And the undesired aircraft state would be airframe damage. So make sure you manage this by verbalizing white arc. So in terms of the effects of flaps, so an increase in flap input will cause a ballooning effect, pitching the nose up. So you'll see this in the training area. Um, we'll extend the flaps once at a time. If you don't do anything, the airplane will balloon. So in response to it, we have to lower the nose as well. And in terms of if you don't have flap, in, uh, the opposite response would be the airplane would sink. So retracting the flaps will cause a sink of the airplane due to the loss of lift, um, and the nose will pitch down if you don't do anything. So you're, you're retracting the flaps, you don't do anything, 
and it causes everything to sink. So that's why when you extend the fla uh, retract flaps, you do it one stage at a time, and you hold that control column. Uh, otherwise, the airplane's nose will sink. And then finally, last not last but not least, the trim. It allows uh, adjustment of control pressures, assisting the pilot by reducing workload. So it's pretty much a poor man's autopilot. A correctly trimmed aeroplane will maintain the attitude without any control input. Um, so for example, you know, you're know you in a climb and you're applying back pressure to maintain that climb. By, allowing, by using that trim, you don't have to be constantly holding back pressure or even in a descent forward pressure. So the trim is this control surface over here. It's on the um, elevator or stabilator as well. So the aeroplane must be trimmed whenever a change of power or angle of attack is uh, made. So as you can see, we've got our, um, sta our stabilator, um, and then we've got the, uh, sorry, we've got the, this is an elevator, um, and that sort of elevator moves, and that trim allows an opposite sort of control, col um, the control, or assists in um, control pressures, um, and it deflects some air in the opposite direction. So uh, trimming is highly underrated and it makes flying a lot more effortless. So make sure you use smooth adjustments to correctly trim the aeroplane. So on aeroplanes, you know, we've got a stabilator trim and a rudder trim. So a stabilator trim is over here in this image. It uh, is a winding trim. We trim backwards if you're holding back on the control column and vice versa. So that's a handy way. Um, and rudder trim, turning dial used to relieve your trim left if you need to hold constant left rudder and vice versa as well, so um, sort of works in the natural sense. Um, and limitations must not be used as a primary control, so you must set the attitude first and then re-trim as well. Um, in our Cherokees, we don't have any trim tabs on the rudder. Uh, what happens is when you trim, the whole, con the whole rudder itself moves a little bit. So taxiing is controlled using power, nose wheel steering, and braking. So aeroplanes, it's meant to fly in, up in the air. So out of on the ground, it's a little bit out of its element. Um, so the upper portion of the pedals controls brakes. So here we've got that left and right pedals. Um, and the lower portion uh, controls nose wheel steering slash rudder in the air. Um, and our aeroplanes, you know, we've got individual braking as well. So it allows us to do tighter turns. Um, and aim to position the nose wheel on the yellow center line. So the our handy tip is make sure that yellow center line sort of goes in between your legs. Uh, that's a good tip. And uh, brake check checked at the earliest opportunity. You know, just in case we do have a brake failure, we can. That's why we check it out straight away. But make sure we're actually rolling and going downhill. Um, and do not power against brakes, as you can wear them out. So if you want to slow down, put the power to idle using the throttle then apply the brakes. So transfer of controls between instructor and student, so using the handing over, taking over method. Um, so if the instructor wants to hand over controls to the student, so I'll say handing over, and to which you'll reply, I have control. If the instructor wants controls, so for example, you've finished demonstrating a maneuver, or there's an emergency situation, I'll say taking over, you'll reply handing over, and then I'll say I have control. The term taking over is only reserved for the instructor. And the last thing you must say, is um, I have control. So we've got that threat in this lesson um, of the incomplete procedure um, and this can result from the incomplete use of um, handing over I have control procedure so not using it. Um, so uh, make sure to use it is um, make sure you use it otherwise you, um, you won't know who is in control. So in terms of the clock code, so the training area has a lot of aircraft operating. So it's quite busy airspace, uh, quite a lot of few schools from Bankstown operating there. Um, and not even just Bankstown training area, you know, BFR pilots you want to be looking out um, for traffic. The clock code is used to help identify traffic and to help avoid them as well. And we rely, rely on that see and avoid principle. Once we've seen traffic, we want to avoid them to avoid um, the air proximity event, because that's a threat that exists, the threat in the training of traffic, the air will be you know, not using the clock code, uh, the undesired aircraft state will be an air proximity event, so make sure you're using the clock code you're looking out as well, so make sure to also have an effective lookout. So in terms of the clock code, 
So imagine a clock face sort of on top of a bird's eye view of the aeroplane. So 12 o'clock is straight ahead, 6 o'clock towards the to behind us, 3 o'clock towards the right, 9 o'clock towards the left as well. So that's really important. Um, and in terms of the clock code, also mention if they're too high, too low, whether in conflict or not. So airmanship. Airmanship is the consistent use of good judgment and well-developed skills to accomplish flight objectives. So it's the IKO definition, um, so International Civil Aviation Organization. So it's kind of like sportsmanship, you know, being a good pilot, you're, um, you're um, being aware of your surroundings, you're being aware of other pilots around you, you're operating in the same environment, um, and you want to, you know, you're working together to accomplish flight objectives. So taxiing speed must be slow enough to stop quickly if the brake fails or for other aircraft vacating runway. So taxi about 10 knots, um, not faster than a sort of jogging speed. If you can't, if you look outside towards your right wing and you can't jog at that speed, you're taxiing too fast. Balance the aeroplane, uh, make sure balance, keep that balance ball in the middle um, using that turn slip coordinator. Look out using the clock code. Listening to your instructor and tower scram and to other traffic as well. Uh, listen to the radio. Um, use a good mental picture of um, other traffic. Make sure you have smooth control inputs. You know, no abrupt inputs. And you're utilizing the handing over slash taking over method as well. So in terms of threat aerometric, so it's a new concept. So a threat, a situation or event that has the potential to impact negatively on the safety of a flight or promotes pilot's errors. So uh, threat is not necessarily within the control of the pilot. So a threat could you know could be internal, um, such as pilot fatigue, <coughs> and um, external. So it could be due to weather. Error, an action or inaction that leads to a deviation from crew or organisational expectations. This reduces the margin of safety. So, for example, a checklist error. Um, you know, you're not following the checklist, you're going too fast, you're missing items. Or communication error. So, you're misinterpreting a radio call from tower or ground. Um, you're not using correct radio, ra radio phraseology as well. Undesired aircraft state are defined as flight crew induced aircraft position or speed deviations, misapplication of flight controls associated with a reduction in margins of safety. So it's the last stage a pilot has before an incident occurs, such as you know, flying bad weather or an air proximity event as well. <coughs> so in terms of threat and management, so we've got threat of traffic, they will be failing to have an effective lookout and the end desired aircraft set will be an air proximity. So the management technique, you know, we've talked about this, is uh, using the clock code and having eyes outside. So it's not limited to these, you know, three threats. There's certainly a lot more that exist, but this is a good sort of three basic threats um, that you can sort of watch out for in today's flight. Stress on airframe, abrupt control inputs is the error. Uh, damage to the airframe is undesired aircraft set. So the management use smooth control inputs as well. So who's in control? In complete use of the procedure is the error and undesired aircraft state is handling controls when instructor is in control. So the management, the management technique is um, using the handing over taking over method. So in terms of the summary, so we looked at objectives, we looked at uh, definitions such as angle attack, relative airflow, cord, attitude and center of gravity. Uh, we looked at the uh, deflection of air, the flat plate theory. Uh, we looked at the axes of an airplane, so there's three axes. Uh, the primary control surfaces as well, um, the ancillary controls, the effects, the limitations. We look at the airmanship and threat neuromagic situations such as traffic, um, taxiing, smooth control inputs, balancing and more sort of trim the airplane and using that handing over, taking over method. And then finally with the objectives. So I'll um, just give you a moment. Um, you, know, you can uh, think of these answers and then I'll read them out. So following this brief, you'll be able to from memory so you can pause the video if you want. Name the four properties that can affect air deflection. So, uh, you know, air angle attack, surface, air density, and air speed. Name the three axes on an airplane. Lateral, longitudinal, and normal axis. Identify the primary controls and state the primary and secondary effects. So, um, for example, the elevator, you've got... Um, uh, causes pitch and second effect is airspeed and describe the function and purpose of the five and three controls so for example car red heat um, un hot unfiltered air um, you can't 
Um, limitation is you can't apply it for longer than 10 seconds on the ground. So have fun and fly safe. And I'll see you in the next brief, which will be straight and loaded. Thank you very much.